Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. We're just giving it a two, two to three minutes while everybody joins. So we're joining today's webinar. We are really excited to present uh, our topic today, which is acceleration to excellence in digital construction. We, we will be focusing primarily our topic on BIM, uh, building information modeling, and ISO 9650, which is an international standard for implementing BIM across, across the world. And today we're going to be focusing on the implementation of ISO 9650 on Autodesk Construction Cloud with our presenters today, Che Kasuf, of, uh, who is our VP of Operation. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. So, um, let's discuss about the powerhouse behind the project. So, first off, we have Accenta. So, um, we as Accenta, imagine you're managing a complex construction project with multiple teams across um, different locations. Your challenge, keeping everything on time, on budget, and running smoothly. That's where Accenta steps in. We don't just sell software. We provide a full suite of implementation, training, and consulting services. We guide your teams, whether you're in the GCC region or anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. To fully unlock the potential of Autodesk Construction Cloud, from optimizing workflows to integrating BIM systems, we're here to help you succeed, driving projects with precision and confidence. Now, imagine you need a tool that, to align your entire team from project managers to site supervisors. Enter Autodesk Construction Cloud. From optimizing workflows to integrating BIM systems, we're... Sorry. Yeah. So, um, and now moving on to uh, Blacksmith Soft. And Omnix. Together, Accenta, Autodesk, Blacksmith Soft, and Omnix form a powerful partnership working to accelerate your journey to, to digital excellence. Today's session is all about giving you the insights, tools, and strategies to enhance collaboration, streamline processes, and ensure your projects are not just successful, but exceptional. Um, so now I'm passing over to um, Osama to introduce all the speakers for this webinar. Thanks, Isabel. Again, we're really excited for this webinar, and, and I think we are really lucky to have such amazing speakers with us today with that brings in years and years and years of, of experience and wealth of experience and knowledge to, to this really exciting uh, webinar. So if you go to the next slide so we can introduce the first speaker. The first speaker, of course, is Jay Kasuf. Jay Kasuf has a, a Bachelor's of Engineering and Mechanical with over 25 years of experience working for some of the largest construction firms across the world. The first one is actually a consolidated contractors company, which is a company that I actually worked, worked with before. We haven't overlapped, unfortunately, but I'm really excited to be working with you right, right now, Che. Uh, che has a lot of experience in, in, uh, in driving digital transformation projects across the world, really. Uh, uh, looking at, at, at some, of, uh, some of their clients, such as hospital projects, property developers, energy equipment manufacturers and contractors, Metro projects, airport terminals, property developers, again, contractors, all the way from, from small projects such as property villas to mega, mega projects. We are really excited to have Che with us today to share some of his experiences as well as looking at how Autodesk Construction Cloud could be the engine for driving ISO 9650 within your organization and your framework. The next speaker is, of course, Tolene Awad. Tulin is an architect, a BIM Collaborate Pro expert, as well as a customer success strategist. As a customer success strategist and BIM Collaborate Pro expert at Accienta, Tulin specializes in helping clients navigate their digital transformation journey. She has a background in architecture and extensive experience in optimizing project workflows using, of course, BIM Collaborate Pro. Tulin excels at tailoring solutions to meet the unique customer needs. She, of course, has a pro proven record of leading webinars and training sessions on advanced construction technologies like Forma and Twin Motion. Tolene's ex expertise empowers construction teams to work smarter and streamline their processes for better project outcomes. We're really excited to have you 
today with us in the webinar, Chalene, and we really do look forward to your insightful uh, uh, conversations. The next speaker, of course, is Chuck. Chuck Ferzelli is the Sales and Marketing VP at Blacksmithsoft uh, in Construction Solutions. As the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Blacksmithsoft, Chuck, of course, brings over two decades of exper expertise in driving sales and marketing strategies for technology solutions in the construction, oil and gas, and engineering sectors. Chuck has a very strong focus on Autodesk Construction Cloud. He's a specialist in, implement in implementation of cutting edge solutions such as BIM 360 and Autodesk Build. Chuck focuses on helping you, the, our customers and our clients to streamline document management, project workflows, and of course, quality control. Chuck has an extensive experience in sales leadership and advanced work packaging, makes an, which makes him an invaluable speaker today. He will share some insights on how technology can revolutionize project execution and collaboration across industries. Last but not Thank least, you for the introduction, Osama. Thanks, Chuck. Last but not least, myself, I am Osama Abdul Hadi. I'm a sales enabling professional at Autodesk. I, I, before joining Autodesk, I have a wealth of experience in both construction and project management. I started off my career as an electric engineer and then moved on my way to specializing in PCBs, construction, getting hands-on exp expertise in managing complex projects. Now at Autodesk, I, I leverage my tech technical background to empower sales teams and provide innovation solutions that drive pro pro project efficiency and compliance. I have a focus on enabling digital transformation across the AECO and DNM industries, as well as media entertainment. And I'm committed to helping professionals navigate your landscape through design and innovation. Of course, I'm not the only person at Autodesk that was involved in this project. We also have multiple uh, project teams. If I can go to the next slide, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the Autodesk project team that was involved for the execution of this project. Myself, I led the project, but of course, I was supported with Najee Atallah, Sicily, Evgenia, Vijay, Iker, and Charity. We need to do appreciate all of the work that, that they've set out to, to, to support this project, support Accenta, Blacksmith Soft, and Omdex. And we really do uh, see uh, a lot of value adding, added to your organization. Moving on to my last slide, which is the mission statement. Our mission is to lead the construction industry transformation from 2D methods to advanced building information modeling practices. We develop, we develop comprehensive BIM templates and guidance documents with the aim to streamline project execution, enforcing high standards of information delivery, and of course, ensure compliance with ISO 9650. By promoting the widespread of, Autodesk, uh, of adoption of Autodesk innovation solutions, we seek to unlock new business opportunities and revolutionize the construction landscape. Additionally, we are dedicated to fostering cross-collaboration opportunities in emerging markets, particularly in the EMEA emerging region. Our goal, of course, is to collaborate, uh, is to create a collaborative platform where industry, part where industry partners can work together or independently even to support customers in advancing their BIM maturity. And again, we are so excited for this webinar I will not take more time. I'll move, uh, I will give uh, the mic over to Che to proceed with the, with the presentation. Please do enjoy and we look forward to your questions and answers. And, and of course, there's gonna be a multiple pause in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. So we look forward, of course, to your engagement. Over to you. Thanks, Osama. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, uh, I will start with a question. Uh, why ISO 19650? What normally could go wrong and how the ISO 19650 can really address those issues? Let's go to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, normally what happens is if you don't tell the designer what you need from day one, he's going to take shortcuts. Even the most respected designer would do that. So accordingly, if you don't tell him how you would like your BOQ to look like, he will make it in line with his requirement. And accordingly, when you get to the use of this BOQ, for example, when you want to do your planning, you want to do quantification and so on, you have to reinvent the wheel. We see it everywhere in our project that 
the planning department have a number of planners who go to drawing, you know, start to search for uh, quantities in order to know how they do their plan properly. In many times, the quantity that comes from the designer is not properly, let's say, classified and segregated to answer the uh, planning and the construction sequence. So in reality, what we are doing, we are moving the bubble. So the designer will say, well, this is hard work for me. I don't want to do it. It goes to control. Control only focus on his uh, part. And accordingly, he will just create the quantity in line with the schedule requirement. Now we reach construction. We see the construction team on site also have to reinvent the wheel and try to uh, to look at the drawing, at the model, and so on. So in reality, we are doing the same job more than once because there have been no real understanding between the various stakeholders. So this is what happens. You will have fragmented data. Everybody have his own silo of document. You have a version control program. So imagine a planner spend one week creating a material takeoff, a new model comes. He would be really reluctant to change it. He will say, well, it's plus or minus 2%. Let's stick with what I have. And this, you know, it, it moves from uh, a phase to phase within this project. So this is the, the first part, which is if there is no pre-agreement between the various parties, this is the sort of problem that could occur. Let's go to the next one. Now, the other part is sometimes there is some collaboration between the, the people or the various stakeholders. So at schematic design, at the detailed design, you know, at construction drawing, uh, shop drawing and facility management, there might be some agreement. Okay, the designer will tell you, okay, I'm, I want to do this, but there are really no standard or no way to guarantee that he is doing those requirements in line with what the uh, subsequent phase required. And normally what happened is uh, he will do it in this fashion. Many people try to mitigate it by creating what we call some interface agreement between various phases. But uh, in the absence of a standard, this also will lead to some missing information. And once, let's say, the design is completed, uh, it will be very hard to go back to the designer and tell him to do some modification because some missing data and so on. So what happened is you can see a designer spending lots of money on creating BIM models, on creating high-end uh, 3D model with a level of detail. But in reality, the subsequent phase do not make use of it. So you can see a big 3D model, which have all the information modeled inside it, but missing some few set of attribute or information, or let's say classification or level of detail. And missing those actually causes you know, this model to not to be usable at, for example, construction or later on when we reach facility management, we might see people have to, you know, take those models, give it to a third party to uh, augment it and add the required information for proper facility management. Uh, next. Now, when we say ISO 19650, in many cases, you will see many companies will be worried about it because looking at ISO 19650, you have something like six sessions, your sections. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and six. And in the same time, everyone have this description like concept and principle, delivery phase of asset. So let's say I am an owner. I will come, okay, why do I need to worry about information exchange or why? Do I need to worry about concept and principle? It will be very difficult for a person to know which part of the nine, ISO 19650 he needs to concentrate on. And especially when we go you know, across the food chain. So when we go to the designer or later on general contractor and maybe the vendors, they don't know where they fit in this whole map. It will be very hard for them to comply with ISO 19650. So there should be some sort of a mechanism to explain for people where do you fit within this puzzle of ISO 19650. Next. Okay, so now I think we're going to need to we're start take a the poll. poll yeah. Isabel, thanks. Yeah, so here's the poll.
We're glad to see so many uh, BIM managers, BIM managers, engineers, yeah. architects joining our call. I'm also curious about, uh, you know, other other uh, roles in, within the webinar. So please feel free to type in the chat uh, your role in the organization. Quite curious about that. Okay, so let's end the ball. Sharing the results. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. So now the question arises is, okay, for me, how can I implement ISO 19650? So there are two ways if you want to implement it. Either you go with a theoretical approach where you go and buy the standard, read them and so on. And as you know, the standard normally are more like generic. They talk about, you know, like general statement. For example, they will tell you, you have to ensure that your revision is always up to date and so on. Or you can go to some sort of people who did it before where they have learned from mistake and so on and will give you, uh, let's say, the, the end result. Now, what I'm going to be sharing is how we can use ACC or Autodesk Construction Cloud Platform in order to implement ISO 19650. I will be referring to some of the requirement as we are going with this implementation, just to give you an idea how uh, compliant ACC is and how you can benefit from using. Let's go to the next slide. So now if we look here uh, in ISO 19650, of course, it uh, emphasizes a lot about who is allowed to do what within the design and within the documentation. So you need to define your people, you need to define the access level, who can approve, who can modify, who can change, who can mark the drawing and, and so on. So accordingly, you need to be able to define those people. The second part in relation to the folder structure and naming convention, also they provide you some sort of uh, folder structure and naming convention requirement in order to be able to just by reading the name of the file, you know where it came from and so on. They also emphasize on versioning and revision management. And also they emphasize on the accountability. So in other words, you need to know who, who any person who did anything in the design, you need to know who was it and when did he do it. And uh, the other part is it emphasized also on the collaboration and coordination. So you need to be able to make sure if you are doing design, you know what other party are doing in parallel so that you do not have to revise it because you were not aware of some changes they did. Now, when you reach the construction stage, you're going to be needing some sort of approval from a third party, whether it is a government or a standardization institute, or maybe even the architect themselves. This is where submittal come into the picture. Also in ISO 19650, they emphasize a lot on the quality. I'm going to be sharing with you how we can leverage uh, ACC for the quality. And then we have the, the asset module. And this asset module, the importance of it is it tell you from day one what are the requirements that you need once you want to run the facility. So it, it works with the end in mind. This is very important. And I'm going to be sharing some of the report that could be produced from the ACC system. Let's go to the next slide. So here, as we can see uh, within the system, you can add role, you can add company, you can add users. And accordingly with those uh, classification that you do, you can define who can do what. I think the next slide will give a better clarity on this, if we can go to the next slide. 
So here, for example, within ISO 19650, they tell you you need to have consumers, creators, controllers, approver, assurer, and all of these uh, people, every one of them have a certain function. For example, a consumer is a person who can view and download a certain set of documents. Uh, a creator is the one who creates the document. So he could be a BIM designer, he could be a, a draftsman, he could be an engineer. The controller is the person who review the workflow. So for example, the controller is the person who overlook what is created by the creator and he will send it for the approver. And then the approver is the initial reviewer and the assurer is the final reviewer. So we can see also we have some level of authority as well. So you can see below the, the possible, uh, let's say, access level that you can provide. So you can even uh, provide a person the ability just to view the file without downloading them. So he cannot download the file or he can view and download. He can view and do some markup, and every one of those levels will define which one to which one it should apply. Next. Now, when it comes to the folder structure, the ISO 19650 recommend two sort of folder structure. The complete one, which as the one you can see on the right, which is have the ABCs accepted drawing partial as constructed or as built. And we have also the S uh, family, which are the work in progress for coordination, for reference, for command, authorization, and acceptance. And normally, many people who are just starting the journey of ISO 19650, they prefer to go to the simplified. And the simplified will have just three folders, uh, work in progress, shared, and published. Now, the concept of this folder is as follows. Work in progress is normally the place where a person does his own work. So for example, I'm creating, let's say, a, a plan of a certain location. I just put the drawing within this folder. Any modification, any uh, update on this drawing, I keep working. So at the end of every day, I synchronize or I make sure that this folder is up to date. Now, once I'm done with this and I want to send it for approval, this is where the BIM Assurer will go and pick up this uh, specific document and he will send it in a workflow for the person who approve it now once it is approved if it is approved just for sharing not to be ifc he will send it to the shared and once it is final approved so that it can be constructed he will send it to the published and all of these folders you know they have the relevant access level the relevant capability for every team member depending on his function next now, uh, as we can see, this is a screenshot from ACC, which show us how the naming convention uh, happened. You see, they have already a default ISO 19650 naming convention. And the uh, naming convention here is divided into two parts. Part which live within the name of the file. So for example, the standard will tell you, you need to know which project you're talking about, who created the document, where it is located within the, uh, the, uh, the project, from a system perspective or location perspective, what type of document we are talking about and what role, uh, who is the person who created it and a sequential number. In addition to this, it also asks you to specify the status, the revision number and the classification of the document. So all of these can be enforced on any document that is created. And the nice thing about it is you can enforce it only on the published, so people can do whatever they want in their way, uh, WIP, but once they want to approve the document, it has to comply with those specific requirements. You can use multiple, uh, let's say, naming standard depending on the folder you want, and this is very important because you might be having, you know, a different, uh, let's say, a flavor of the ISO 19650 naming standard depending on the requirement. Next. Now, I talked a bit about the, the approval workflow. So the approval workflow could be as many steps as you would like, but the, the important part within this workflow is uh, you can uh, decide where the folder will go once it is approved and what happened if it is not approved. So you can see here the status, which is required as per ISO 19650 can be approved, 
rejected approved with command, you can add your own status, but also once you approve it, you can decide where this document will go. So in other words, if you remember the folder I was talking about, these folder, when it comes to shared and published, nobody can go manually and add a certain document. It has to go under this you know, approval workflow. And this is where we have the accountability. We make sure whoever approved this document is a person who's supposed to approve it before it goes to people to work with it. Next. Now, when it comes to revision handling, as we can see, normally, you know, it starts with work in progress and then uh, they might have their own mini version. So you can see A01, A02, A03, A04. Now, once these guys are ready to approve it, it goes via a workflow, it becomes revision A. Of course, if it was not accepted, it can go back to WIP. Now the version become B instead of A, 0102. Now, once they are all approved and it can be published to be used for construction, you can see that the number can be changed to one. And these requirements all can be catered within the ACC system. Next. Okay, here uh, we can see the activity log. Now, why I'm showing this screenshot? Because even if you are the administrator in Autodesk, you cannot really delete or play around with those data. They are like cast in stone. So a person who move a document, approve it, reject it, whatever they do, we have a full log of what they did and when, the date of each and every one of activity. This really enforces the uh, accountability. And I believe uh, Autodesk have all the security certificates that are required in order to, to, to verify those. Next. Now, when it comes to handling design, we can see the when working with the design, the most important part is to make sure that if you are working in parallel with other discipline, let's say you are an MEP and somebody is working on the architecture, if there are any clashes, you have to make sure that they are witnessed as you are building your project. And this is, as you can see in this project timeline, it has those packages. Once you consume the package, you have a reference to what other people are working in at that specific point in time. And you know whether you have a clash or not to rectify it before it goes to issuance. So this is where working with design become important. Everybody knows what everybody is working. They are always up to date. And of course you have a matrix summary, you have a visual view of what is going wrong if there is any, and all of these are live. Next. Now, uh, when we reach construction, it's very important that the set or the packages that you need approval for, for example, you need to secure a material approval from the architect, or you need to secure some, uh, you know, drawing approval from a governmental authority. So all of these can be sent via packages, and this is where we can prepare the package and send it, and they have their own workflow. You can group a certain document, add the specification, add the standard, and all of these can be into one single package and share. Next. Now, when it comes to quality management, normally uh, when you are talking about the quality of the design, now we are used to quality in the construction itself, like you have those quality control forms and you have a checklist and no. Now, when it comes to the design also, the same approach can be used. So in this case, any model that is being shared, for example, for a person to approve it, he needs to make sure that he really approves it based on a certain criteria. So the screenshot that you can see here, it will show you if somebody is approving a certain design, he needs to check, for example, the floor, the wall, and so on. And he will say, are they compliant or not? He needs to sign it. And all of these could be formed within the ACC build. And these form can be signed, approved, and they have a certain workflow. So you will have a full history of the quality approval. Next. Now, I was talking about the asset. Uh, the ACC system will give you a new dimension when it comes to asset. So you can see here, for example, 
part of your Revit model, you can add a copy extension. And this one will tell you, or will tell, let's say, your uh, designer and the people who are authoring the model, what sort of data they need to have available within the model to comply with the facility management requirement. So these are all available. You can see, for example, with this extension, it will add all of these attributes to your model. And once these are added, the second you upload it to the ACC cloud, it will be available in the asset module. And this asset module can leverage all of these information that you see part of the attribute. You can change the color, see the status, follow up on the purchasing, when the expiry of, let's say, the, uh, the expiry uh, uh, of the warranty and so on. All of these can be uh, viewed once you have all of these information. Next. Now, we have seen so many input into the system. Now let's look at the output. This is just a small screenshot of what are the possible report that can come out of the system. So the important part is all the data that we are talking about is actually available for people to extract, you know, work around with it, create some uh, business intelligence dashboard out of it. And this is some small screenshots. So you can see here S-curve, you can see interaction with model, you can see issues, you can see uh, cost, uh, you can see all, uh, let's say, sort of report that are required. And keep in mind that because those rely on uh, business intelligence, so you can even take data from outside ACC to enrich your report as well. Uh, next. Now, of course, what I have shown you are just a mere screenshot of the system. So you can see that we have uh, a ISO 19650 implementation guide for ACC, and this is available free for all Autodesk users. I think you need to contact uh, Accienta for this. On the right-hand side, you can see the table of content. It's around 90-page document with screenshots, step-by-step, -step, what you do in every part. Of course, there are also a set of comprehensive templates for you know, the uh, EIR, BEP, uh, PIR, YR, and there are, these are a set of standard documents. I believe Tolin now will uh, take the lead and elaborate further on these documentation. Uh, thanks all. Tolin, off Thank to you. you. Thank you, Che. Hello, everyone, and welcome again. Once again, my name is Tulian Awad. I'm more than happy to be here helping you guys throughout this journey. So what will be in this package? Uh, can you go next, please? So in this package, we're going to find a couple of tools that will help us implement it. Basically, first of all, we have the self-assessment tools. What are these? These are only to figure out where you stand with your BIM capabilities. Next, we have a quick start guide to get your team rolling with the right steps, templates, uh, and workflows to boost efficiency. And lastly, we have detailed resources. So these are fully editable templates, implementation manuals, and in-depth guides to take your BIM game to the next level. So the key highlights here are the exchange information requirements, which is uh, the EIR. Now, I will be talking more in depth about these um, guides in a bit, but I'll just give you an overview right now. So the EIR is the VIP of the documents. It defines the information standards and outlines everything your partners need to know about your project goals, such as the architect, the contractor, and so on. And we also have the BIM execution plan, which also stands for BEP. So this is the project specific roadmap that aligns with your EIR and ensures that everyone follows the same standards, workflows, and responsibilities. So on the right, here we can see uh, this handout, which will be given to you in a bit, it will be sent out. So here we can see the journey from the self-assessment to the OIR, to the AIR, and lastly to the BEP. Next, please. So before we get going, we have a quick poll. We want to know what you think. So it's gonna pop up in a bit. So how familiar are you with the ISO 19650 standard? Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, not familiar at all? So this is a judgment-free zone. Please go ahead and give us your answers. Mm 
We're just going to give it a couple of more seconds. Great. So 60% of you guys are somewhat familiar with the ISO 19615. I'm happy to hear that. For those who are not familiar, don't worry, we're going to try to introduce it a bit into this uh, webinar. Thank you. Another poll we have right here is how does your organization currently use Autodesk products in relation to ISO 19650? So there's, there's a couple of uh, options. We use Autodesk software to comply with ISO 19650. Uh, 19650. We use Autodesk solutions, but not for this purpose. We use other software for ISO 19650 compliance or other. Please go ahead and answer. You have a couple of seconds. A couple of more seconds and we'll close the poll. Great. So 74% of you, I'm so happy with the number, use Autodesk software to comply with the ISO 19650. That's very good to hear, actually. Great. So we're done with the polls and now Let's us see how the documents would link together and help us throughout the BIM implementation journey. To start with, we have the OIR. So what is the OIR? OIR stands for Organizational Information Requirements. This is a very crucial document when working with BIM projects. Essentially, OIR defines the specific data needs and organize and the expectation of a certain organization throughout the entire life cycle of a project. So in every project, you have the planning, the design, the construction, and then you have the operation. So in the, in the organizational information and requirements, you are putting all of the different information requirements you have internally as an organization. And this is the founding document that defines all the information needs. So here you specify what the requirements are as an organization, or, or as an example, what type of ass risk assessments you need to do, type of reports, how do you monitor these reports, um, how do you monitor these projects, how do you report them, what requirements are needed for training and educating people. And of course, you have the level of development, the LOD. The LOD is changing when you're planning, it's uh, at a very low level. 100 and when you're designing you go to a 200 so here what you are doing as an organization the level of detail uh, you want to get to for an example you have a company that is more than happy to stop at 250 at the construction phase so in summary oir acts as a compass that directs the early stages of a project ensuring that the information related objectives are aligned and strategic goals are aligned as well so it guides effective asset management throughout the project life cycle Next, we have the AIR. So the AIR stands for Asset Information Requirements. So here it defines the asset information needs and standardizes it. It facilitates life cycle management of the assets, including the uh, IM process. It also supports for uh, facility management and decision making. And lastly, it optimizes the asset performance. So the next document is actually the PIR. So OIR is for all types of buildings and uh, PIR is the specific for the project itself. So what is a PIR? A PIR, the project information requirements, it outlines the specific information requirements necessary for the successful execution of a certain project. So this includes details such as project scope, deliverables, schedules, budget, quality standards, and any other relevant information that the stakeholders need to know. 
So the PIR is whole project or whole job, uh, sorry, that it provides a unique information for the project level. So the two documents before the PIR, the OIR is for the whole organization, as we said, and the AIR is for the assets that will be delivered in general, not specifically for this project. And the PIR is for that certain project. So this is a document that actually sets the boundaries and the parameters for defining a project scale and purpose that has to be done by the owner. So this typically aligns with the project objectives and the certain deliverables and guides information management, detailing the types of data required, how they should be structured and explained. So let me give you an example. The project that you are working on that the contractors are going to be working on. What kind of models are they going to be producing? Uh, so um, are they going to be producing a Revit model? What are their conventions, their standards? What about the drawings documents? Are they going to be DWG or some other format? How will coordination be done? Is it to be done throughout Navis Works or any other system? So all this information is uh, dictated in the PIR, as specific as to a certain project. Now, all of these documents will be used to create uh, the BEP, the AIR, sorry. Now, the important part, the reason why these documents are present, because they have uh, noticed that not everyone who is working on the project has the bigger picture or the end in mind. As we have mentioned earlier, this is very important to provide the people who are operating the facility the proper information. So if we don't have a proper PIR, OIR, AIR, people like, for example, the construction team will only think that uh, what will they uh, need as a construction team and they will miss stuff that are important such as the handover for later on the operation and and finally we have the AIR. So AIR here is the star of the show. The AIR is created from the OIR, the PIR and the AIR. Uh, when it comes to the AIR, the exchange information requirements, think of it as the blueprint that pulls everything together, the OIR, PIR, AIR, to set the rules for information management on a specific project. It tells the whole team, such as the designers, contractors, operators, exactly what information they need to deliver and how to do it. For example, if you are working on a hospital project, the AIR would specify that the design team needs to provide uh, the Revit models up to LOD 300 for the operating rooms. The construction teams has to use Navisworks for class protection. The facility managers require Kobe spreadsheets uh, to support asset maintenance after the building is handed over. So what's the key point here? The key point that it ensures everyone from design to operations uh, to work together towards the same goals with the right data and in the right format, making handover smoother. It keeps all the players aligned so the building's future users aren't left out of the conversation. So if you want to think of it in a different way, you can think of it as a recipe. Without it, the project might turn off out like a dish where everyone brought their own ingredients, but no one followed the same instructions. So after that, the owner provides the AIR, it's now up to the project team and any parties other than the owner, particularly the general contractor, the GC, to create their own BIM execution plan, the BEP. So think of the BEP as the project BIM playbook. The AIR has laid out the what, now the BEP will define the how. The GC takes all the requirements from the AIR and it turns it into a roadmap for executing the project using BIM, ensuring every other party knows exactly how to move forward. It's like planning a complex construction dance. Everyone needs to know their steps to avoid the chaos, of course. So any party that uh, wants to work with the client needs to create their own BEP. So what's the BEP? Uh, what's in the BEP? Actually, there are the rules and responsibilities. So here it outlines who does what, whether it's the architects, engineers, contractors, everyone's related, uh, everyone's BIM related tasks are clearly defined. So there is no confusion when it comes to time to deliver. Standards and guides are also present in the BAP, so it sets the rules for how the BIM will be used from the LOD level of detail, expected at different stages to which software tools they will be using, and how the model's data will be shared. It's like setting the game rules before starting construction. 
So everyone's on the same page. And we have lastly, the workflow and collaboration. So it establishes how the BIM data flows, ensuring that everyone has access to the right uh, information at the right time. Uh, so what's the best part about this? The owner approves the BEP once it's ready, making sure that it's, it hits all the key points, outlined the EIR, so nothing important gets missed. In short, the BEP is like the project's BIM GPS, let's say. It defines the standards, assigns rules, sets the course for how the BIM will be implemented with everyone following the same map. It ensures smooth collaboration and successful delivery from design to uh, construction. So from the BEP, we have the BIM models delivery, and we can also um, get out of it the project information models and the asset information models. So why contact us, Accenta and BSS? Basically, we're gonna help you with the ACC licensing, implementation, and corporate or product tailor training. We also are gonna help you with the ISO 19650 implementation using ACC with tailored corporate or project requirements. We're gonna help you integrate experts, ACC, Power BI, ERP. We're gonna also help you with the construction and engineering since uh, we have site experience in four different continents. So you can contact myself, Tulin Awad, at tulin.awad at axianta.com. You can also contact Che Kasouf at che at blacksmithtuff.com. You can download our documents or you can stay pleased on Axianta's mailing list for the series of presentations. Great. Thank you, Tulin. I'll uh, just take uh, over from here. Uh, so everyone after this uh, call, um, we will be sharing the uh, webinar recording and we'll be sharing a link for all those documents. There are a lot of documents. It's volumes actually of um, uh, guides, uh, templates, and also an implementation plan or an uh, implementation step-by-step -step in ACC. And it's not just uh, ACC docs, but also ACC build, it also touches on Autodesk BIM Collaborate Pro uh, as well. So those will be coming uh, uh, your way and then if you have uh, any uh, questions about them, you can feel free to reach out to us. Now we'll take some uh, uh, Q&A. I believe the guys may have already uh, uh, started um, answering some of your uh, questions, but feel free to start putting them in the Q&A. We have one question from Mr. Mohammed. Al Madi, he's asking, what is the best asset classification to consider when linking assets in BIM? to tandem and he has also a follow-up question in short what should the pir include is it somehow similar to the oir so che if you could uh go ahead for those two yeah. questions uh sure so uh mainly the uh the asset uh, classification now the the one that is you know uh, widely known is the the kobe but the truth is uh, there are no, uh, let's say, best classification. It all depends on your project type and your requirement. You know, this is something that also very important when deciding on the asset classification. You need to, to question and make sure you know what sort of asset you are having. So if you are working with an airport, is totally different than you are working with a building, totally different if you are working with an infrastructure or metro station. So it depends on those and accordingly, this is where you can, you know, make the decision on the classification. Uh, for the second question, now we are talking about the PIR and the OIR. OIR is just a way to organize your data. So in other words, the owner will tell you, look, I would like my data to be in this organization. I want you, for example, that's how I want you to classify your model. This is how I want the asset to be classified. Now, when it comes to the PIR, this is at the project level. In this case, he will tell you, for example, what the expectation from your side, what sort of information, what is the format of this information, how often you need to send it. 
uh, I think uh, once you get a hold of the uh, template that uh, uh, Accienta will be sharing with the Autodesk uh, users, uh, you will be able to see a full detail on those because there is an extensive explanation about those two documents. Okay. Um, great. Um, uh, are there any other uh, questions? I know about seven were answered uh, already uh, one on one. If you do have any questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to take them. Anyway, when we do send uh, the um, email with the uh, recording and the library of the documents, we will make sure to include um, our phone and emails as well so that you can uh, drop in and ask us uh, any uh, questions. Oh, uh, we have one question from Mr. Uh, Ahab. Uh, how can the standards, how can these standards be implemented for newcomers? Uh, gradually, how? So, Che, uh, what would you say the best step for a, a person who's new to the ISO 1960 and maybe new to ACC as well? Uh, now, for the uh, newcomer, I think the, mm -hmm. the best approach uh, would be is to understand exactly where you fit in the organization. So, are you a vendor? Are you a contractor, a subcontractor? It depends on this functionality. And accordingly, depending on this functionality, you will know which one to emphasize on. For example, if you are, let's say, a, a general contractor, for example, you don't need to worry about creating any IR, but you need to know how to read it so that once you create your BEP, it will be in line with the EIR requirement. In other words, you know, like the BEP is nothing but a document to prove to the owner that you understand what he needs and how you are planning to deliver what he needs. This is in short. Uh, che, we have a question from um, Mr. Willem yeah. and then from uh, uh, Tamuyit. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, now for the uh, Mr. Willem, the, the issue is if you are not using the folder, it will be very hard to decide the access level. This is uh, in a way when we are talking about ACC. So in other words, for example, you can use the custom attribute or the document property to decide on the status and so on. But the only problem you will be facing who have access or who can see the published document. Because as you know, you might have so many subcontractors, so many vendors, and you want a specific set of those documents to be visible. Now, definitely I showed you the highest level, which is the S1, S2, but underneath those, there will be many subfolder and every one of those subfolder will have its own access level. So this one is available, for example, for an architect, but it shouldn't be visible, for example, for a third party vendor and so on. Especially if you want to create, uh, you know, subcontract packages for people to, to pay and so on. This is the part that the, the folder structure is, is important. Okay, and we have one last question, Che, from Tamuyit. Um, concerning Kobe, which is a very interesting subject these days. Okay, now for the, uh, we need to keep in mind that the LOD itself is more or less how much you go into a level of detail within uh, the, the model. Now, when it comes to Kobe, you need to keep in mind that this is only about the asset. So in some cases, you know, the, the data which are available within the copy could be very extensive, even if you are not reaching even LOD 300. And in some cases, you don't even need to bother about it. So it depends on the facility management requirement. This is where you need to decide the, the level of detail. So, but in short, once you reach the handover, uh, state so at the handover states and you you have your as built so this could be a an od 400 or 500 even at that level not all the element within the model would require some kobe data it depends on your uh, asset uh, information requirement this is where you decide which one to be yazan hijazin hello yazan we have two minutes left so yeah, yeah. so 
with all these required documents, I have a feeling that there is somehow a repetitive information between these documents, and this makes the process a bit confusing. Yeah, this is uh, sure, uh, Yazan. Uh, the process might look a bit confusing uh, if you if you want to look at document by document, and this is, I believe, where we come into the picture to uh, make it simpler and show you exactly where you fit in this whole map. This is uh, where we, we come into the picture. So you need uh, a specialized people within this topic in order to, to help you. Otherwise, you have you know to, to undergo all the reading and learn from your mistake as we did, and accordingly, you will be able to, to implement. Okay, great. Yeah, and now, uh, I understand, Mr. Will, but this is, you know, this is an Autodesk uh, development thing. I think the this question need to go to Osama. Maybe you can pass it to the uh, to the development team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I I took it as a note. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, we need to to close. Uh, yes. What yeah. we can, what we will do is the remaining uh, questions. We will one on one, um, you know, send you an email, and then we can have maybe a follow up uh, call uh, over Zoom, uh, and answer you these questions because we've just run out of time. Um, Isabel, is there anything you'd uh, like to say to wrap up uh, this uh, webinar? Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, coming for this uh, webinar. Uh, I believe um, there's going to be a series of uh, webinar after this. Am I correct, Chuck? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's going to be a series of webinars that's going to deep dive into each of these different documents. So we'll be having sessions for the PIR, OIR, AIR, all the way to the EIR, which is, as mentioned by Tolin, the most important document in this process. And there will be also sessions for contractors, uh, for the BEP uh, documents and everything to be more focused on documents and standards rather than uh, technology, but we will also mention about how this links to Autodesk. And finally, there we will also do a webinar, uh, a, like a workshop webinar on implementing it step by step inside of uh, Docs. Uh, and build giving an example of, um, you know, a typical example in the simplified ISO 19650. Uh, but this was just really a first uh, session to get everybody <clears throat> involved. We're also planning to have a group on LinkedIn so that we can keep following up uh, with these uh, events and if there's any issues with the documents. And by the way, these documents are available in several languages. I believe they're available, uh, the documents, the libraries, they're available in English, in French, in Arabic, and in Turkish language, I believe. Exactly. Yep. Yes. Yep. So uh, it, it covers and uh, maybe we'll roll out other, the other languages will be roll, uh, rolled out soon. But uh, um, yep. Thank you all for uh, attending and thank you. Um, uh, Autodesk, Accienta, Omnix, and uh, Che from our team in Blacksmithsoft in the Netherlands. Okay.